Prof, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for mm. making time mm. uh, to speak to us uh, mm. here on Look Up TV. Mm. Um, I want to start off first of all with a matter that is very close to your heart, mm -hmm. and that is the unity of the African continent. Mm -hmm. And I want to tie this to the COVID-19 pandemic. Mm -hmm. Today, we are seeing Western countries, the so-called rich countries, mm -hmm. are already giving their third boosters mm -hmm. to their citizens for the COVID-19 um, uh, pandemic in terms of prevention. While 98% of African countries, mm -hmm. uh, especially citizens, remain unvaccinated, there's been a lot of vaccine inequality, mm -hmm. um, if you may. Uh, I want to read your thoughts on, on this, because we have had this pandemic with us for over a year now. Uh, what, what rings in your mind when you hear such kind of information? First of all, let us agree that the COVID pandemic caught the world unawares, mm -hmm. and that therefore many African countries, like many countries in the world, had what I call a knee-jerk reaction to the pandemic. Mm. But this is not the first, if you may, not pandemic, but epidemic mm -hmm. that Africa has had to go through. If you look at the more recent history, you remember the Ebola epidemic, which was concentrated in the western part of Africa and was, in my view, dealt with reasonably well. One would have thought that African countries would be better prepared, that the World Health Organization would be better, better prepared, that the Center for Disease Control based in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, under the aegis of the African Union, would be better prepared, and its five other regional subsidiaries would be better prepared. But that was not to be the case. Mm -hmm. And this is, once again, a testament to the fact that our continent and the political leadership is always in a state of unpreparedness. Mm -hmm. In the month of April, the year 2001, African nations under the auspices of the African Union met in Abuja in Nigeria mm -hmm. and agreed that they would spend 15% of their budgets in health. The truth is that none of the African countries have reached that level. Perhaps it is only Botswana, Rwanda, and Morocco mm. that may have achieved that kind of level of expansion. Yeah. And the little money that is then budgeted for health is misappropriated in a number of countries. We have seen such alleged misappropriation not only in Kenya, but in Nigeria, in Malawi, in South Africa, and a host of other countries. And now we come up with the vaccine. Mm -hmm. You remember very early on in the early days of COVID-19, the Malagasy Institute of Applied Science did come up with what was described as COVID organic. Mm -hmm. It is only the governments, I think, of uh, Tanzania, Ghana, and Equatorial Guinea that put a stamp of approval on these African initiative. And after that, COVID organic has disappeared and we have uh, done what we do best, to look to the West, mm. to look to other civilizations. So that today, your typical African politician is looking to Pfizer, is looking to Johnson & Johnson, is looking to Sinovac, is looking to AstraZeneca, is looking to Sputnik, and very soon we'll be looking to Abdallah from Cuba. And when I hear African heads of states and ministers of health saying there is COVID inequality, I say, who owes you a duty? Nobody owes Africa duty to supply it with vaccine. And what has now happened is that under the COVAX project, mm -hmm. Africa appear to have received vaccines whose efficacy is being doubted. I personally, this is a personal <laughs> testimony, mm -hmm. I was vaccinated mm -hmm. and my certificate said that I had been vaccinated with Covishield. Mm -hmm. And I raised this issue in writing mm -hmm. with the minister for the time being in charge of health in Kenya asking why it is that Covishield is being doubted. Mm -hmm. I received another certificate saying that I've been vaccinated with AstraZeneca. 
and I raised an issue. Mm. And I've received a response from the principal secretary in charge of health telling me there is no difference between COVID shield and AstraZeneca. And, and this is the kind of thing that worries me. Mm. Are we receiving the dregs of what the world has rejected? Do we even have bureaus of standardization mm -hmm. that are capable of saying whether the vaccines we are receiving are potent or not? And, and this is an indictment of African governments. It is an indictment of our disunity. And in all these, I hear eloquent silence mm. from the CDC in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. So in a nutshell, we are in a very bad space and we want to blame others. While we have ministers for health, we have budgets going into ministries of health. In Kenya, we have seen how the funds that were allocated for this particular epidemic appear to have been lost and there is no consequence. So it's a very sorry state in the continent of Africa. It's a sorry state, as you say. Um, I, I want to understand, we are seeing today a sort of concerted effort um, by the government of Kenya to try and rally people to take the vaccines. There's even been an ultimatum given for public servants on, on a date that all of them must have been <laughs> vaccinated. Yes. With all these doubts that um, are surrounding the whole vaccination process, like you've even said for yourself in your own personal case, how do the citizenry then react? How do the citizenry then take up this initiative? Um, on one end, you know, there's the, I need to be protected from this um, unknown virus. Uh, virus. Uh, but on the other side, there's this doubt of whether I'm getting the right, um, uh, you know, vaccine or not. I mean, if you're in the shoe of that common one, Angie, they keep saying, mm. I mean, how would you be reacting to all this? First of all, I would blame my government because what we have seen in, the, in, in Kenya, for example, mm -hmm. is an administration whose only claim to fame is that they churn out statistics through ministerial statements mm -hmm. without more. Yeah. And I'm always surprised that the minister in charge of health in this country addresses the country in English. Mm -hmm. I would have expected that if the majority of Kenyans are speakers of the Kiswahili language, you would make deliberate effort to educate the people. Mm -hmm. I am suggesting to, to you and to Kenyans that the people have not been sufficiently educated. And the correct information that is going out is competing with this information, mm. which is to be found in the social media. And I do not see concerted efforts that are going out there that is meant to educate the people and therefore people are becoming suspicious. And when they hear that what they are being told will be used to vaccinate them is what in their view has been rejected by Europe and America and other places, then they are bound to be suspicious. And once again, when you hear uh, the head of civil service say, you civil servants, mm -hmm. If you don't get vaccinated on this day, then there'll be threats. That is not how to govern in the 21st century. You persuade your population and your workers by force of reason, mm -hmm. not by reason of force, force and not through threats and cajolement. And, and this is becoming a part of the DNA of the conduct of governmental affairs in this country to tell people if you don't do this we are going to punish you in this way mm -hmm. and and this is an indictment of of the government it is is a statement that the ministry of health is not acting in a proper way and people are now being coerced by threats and through ultimata and and it is very sad you ought to educate the people i would have wanted to see the uh, county governments educating the people all of them have uh, ccs in charge of health, I would have wanted to see like it used to be in those early days with the chiefs holding barazas mm -hmm. and educating the people and having uh, medical officers of health, people who have the training talking to the people. One of the problems in this country uh, which, which undermines all good efforts is bureaucrats and politicians who have arrogated to themselves the monopoly of knowledge and wisdom mm -hmm. 
and speak out of turn even in cases where they should allow the professionals to take the lead. Mm -hmm. The statement that, 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 that I hear emanating from the head of civil service would have made more sense it, if it came from Dr. Amoth, mm -hmm. who is a trained professional mm -hmm. and who I have reason to believe. Mm -hmm. And I believe if it is a professional who was speaking, he would not speak in those terms. He would speak in terms that address the science of the vaccine and telling the people that is in your good, is in your best interest to be vaccinated. That is how you govern in the 21st century. That is how you govern civilized people. You don't deal with civilized people as if they were colonized people. Mm -hmm. There's been a scenario where we all go to bed and wake up not knowing how the numbers would be looking like in the sense of managing this COVID-19 pandemic. Today, the uh, positivity rate is reading 14 point something. Tomorrow, it is reading eight. And there's no proper way as a person from the outside in terms of analyzing this data to know whether we are winning this battle against COVID-19 or not. And I wanna ask you whether you feel the battle was lost already from day one based on how um, you know and who has been handling the whole process of information to the public how it's been given what else do you think we've done wrong and we need to work on immediately if we are to beat this thing let me uh, preface my answer with a caveat mm -hmm. that i speak uh, without being an expert but one sufficiently intelligent i believe to be able to consume information as i see it first of all i think that the statistics like all statistics really do not reflect the whole truth mm. but the other thing i know is that COVID is real mm -hmm. and i believe that there are many people who are uh, uh, suffering under the weight of COVID in many parts in rural Kenya and in the informal settlements in urban areas and that we do not have the capacity or the resources to really take a proper stock of what uh, the, the, the impact of, of the pandemic. Mm. But the other reality is that the pandemic is one that continues mutating. Mm. So that even if one wanted to uh, to judge uh, the government harshly, one, one would uh, be a little slow to do that in appreciation of the fact that the burden of this pandemic on the health sector is one that could not have been foreseen. But I think that there are things that we can learn on the go. Mm. I think that there should be better coordination. I think that the political class should behave a lot more decently. And I'm suggesting to you that we have a very mannerless political class. Mm. They say things publicly and ask the people to behave in a particular way. But the following day, they themselves are engaging in reckless behavior. They are behaving as if they are superior beings and it sends a very wrong message and a very wrong signal to the population. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that I would want to do is that I would want to see the Minister for Health giving professionals a greater space mm. to speak to the public. This is not a political issue in the manner in which it is being handled. This is a health issue. I, of course, it is not lost on me that it has political and economic implication. But I would rather I listen to doctors. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'd rather I listen to epidemiologists. I'd rather I listen to people who can answer four successive questions without reference to another person. Mm -hmm. They would be more believable. To the political class, it is important that you do what you preach. You cannot be holding these rallies. You cannot behave, be attending funerals and behaving recklessly. The people in many parts of the country then say, if the politicians are behaving in the manner that they are, then this pandemic does not exist. These wrong signals are not good. And Kenya is leading in this kind of recklessness. Mm. I've visited a number of African countries and you see seriousness mm. Mm. from the political class. And this is the kind of seriousness that you want to see when you are dealing with this particular issue. This pandemic, which as I've said, is a moving target that keeps on changing and is ravaging our economy as you and me know it. Right. Prof, I want to move from Kenya to neighboring uh, Tanzania. Mm -hmm. 
um, where your great friend, mm -hmm. the late uh, John Pombe Magufuli, um, you know, uh, passed away, and there's a new administration under uh, 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 Her Excellency Madame mm -hmm. Suluhu, who has now actually embraced the uh, COVID-19 uh, prevention measures, including vaccination, mm -hmm. which um, her predecessor, I mean, uh, did not um, mm -hmm. want uh, to be done. In fact, at those times, he kept saying um, uh, the vaccinations are not things that we should embrace. Mm -hmm. I want to read your mind on the new direction that Tanzania is taking when COVID, <coughs> as far as COVID-19 is concerned, especially looking at your reaction mm -hmm. when it came to how President, the late Magufuli, was handling COVID-19? First of all, let us understand one thing. The Western media and uh, the Western-controlled African media were made to project Magufuli as a denier who was refusing to accept science. Mm -hmm. That was not my understanding. Mm -hmm. President Magufuli took the view that there is a problem, there is a covid and indeed, you'll remember that his administration did close schools in the early days, did do the thing that everybody else was doing. But he subsequently took the view that in responding to this pan pandemic, there should be no one size fits all. Each country should respond on the basis of the realities. He therefore refused to close the economy. He therefore refused to make the wearing of masks mandatory on the basis that there would be hard immunity. What we forget mm -hmm. is that Sweden adopted the same approach. What we forget is that South Korea did adopt the same approach, but because this is an African country which ought not to defy, is then projected as an outlier. And of course, it is true that the Tanzanian economy really has never been closed mm. uh, during this entire period, even after President Sulu Hassan took over. And at that time, you will remember, as I've already indicated, uh, Madagascar came up with COVID organic mm. and they embraced it. His view was that Africans should have solutions which are informed by the realities on the ground mm -hmm. and not to be reliant on other civilization. What has now happened is that the administration of Sulu Hassan has taken the view mm -hmm. that we are going to do what everybody else is doing. We are accepting the vaccines. That is the approach of a new administration. Mm -hmm. And in my view, it does not for one minute suggest that the other approach was completely without merit. Mm -hmm. It simply says that this administration has succumbed to the general wave and is now succumbing to a very dominant and, and, and a very aggressive Western world, because the Western world is now dictating to the world what ought to happen. Mm -hmm. And it's not only in Tanzania. Mm -hmm. We've seen how they are dealing with India. They are telling India that the vaccine that you produce are not good enough. They are introducing vaccine passports and they are telling you which vaccines are acceptable. And, and once again, even as I talk about Tanzania, I hold the view that the only way in which Africa is going to immunize herself from the dictations of Western Europe is to work as a united front. It is disappointing, my brother, mm -hmm. that when this pandemic came about, we did not have what I call a unified East African approach. Mm -hmm. I would have loved for Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania, Rwanda, Burundi, the Democratic Republic of Congo, and of course uh, South Sudan and even Ethiopia and Somalia to read from the same script. Mm -hmm. I would have expected the same from the SADA countries and from ECOWAS and ultimately that this would have gelled into a continental approach even for purposes of easing travel. But as always, they succeeded in dividing us and telling us that you should go it alone. The consequence now is that you are asking this question that you're asking, why is Tanzania behaving this way? Why is Kenya behaving this way? While it should have been, why, why is Africa responding this way? Right. Mm. And, and so the forefathers of mm. the continent of Africa, the late Kwame Nkrumah, mm. Julius Nyerere, mm. You know, their dream was a unified mm -hmm. African continent. And the key question is, what has made it impossible for the continent to really unite? Because we've had a lot of conferences, even in Kigali during mm -hmm. the uh, free uh, movement, the, the, the mm -hmm. F uh, FTA, mm -hmm. uh, you know, we signed a protocol 
to allow for free trade across uh, the continent. You've talked about the Maputo Protocol. Mm. You've talked about the East African Community Treaty, mm. which are mostly very great on paper, mm. but non-functional on the ground. What is really our disease as a continent? Is, is I, I think uh, the founding fathers were quite clear and they identified the problem very early mm -hmm. that uh, the post-colonial agenda and the project of the erstwhile colonizers was to ensure that the already arbitrarily, arbitrarily created nations of Africa would not thrive. Mm -hmm. And you've got to see our current problems in the context of our history that as early as 1960, as we were struggling for independence, the continent was already divided into two distinct groups. The Casablanca group led by Kwame Nkrumah, Ahmed Ben Bella at that time, which wanted a united Africa, united states of Africa, almost a federal structure. Mm -hmm. And the other group which had been captured by the West, known as the Monrovia group led by Felix Ufe Boigny of La Côte d'Ivoire, were already persuaded that it should not be so. And we ended up in the month of May 1963 in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, with the Organization of African Unity. And, and, and Krumah was quite clear. If we do not unite now, we are going to get used to our so-called sovereignties. Mm. Our enemies are going to manipulate us. They are going to ensure that we are warring amongst one another and ultimately it will be very difficult to unite because in our disunited state, we are more susceptible to manipulation and we are more susceptible to exploitation. And this is what we see now. Mm. A continent that is divided into 55 units which claim sovereignty but which are very weak and incapable of resisting the uh, very aggressive intervention of the conceptual West and now that of China. Mm. And, and it is very easy if you come to a country like Kenya or visit Nigeria now which is under uh, going through very many threats or in Ethiopia where there is a fratricidal war or in South Sudan or in Cameroon or in Sudan, you can see that it is very easy when you are disunited and small to manipulate and to have fifth columnist politicians mobilizing people on the basis of very dangerous ethnicity. Mm. And this is what we see now. Mm. And therefore, because countries don't want to surrender their sovereignty, they become satellite states of Western countries. And, and it's going to continue because when I look at the current crop of politicians at the helm, there are very few of them who are really Pan-Africanists and are wedded to the Pan-African agenda in the manner that Nkrumah was, in the manner that Patrice Emery Lumumba was, in the manner that Nelson Mandela to a lesser degree was, in the manner that Julius Nyerere was, or later Samora, or Thomas Sankara. The current crop of politicians, I'm normally very reluctant to refer to them as leaders, mm. the current crop of politicians are much more preoccupied with occupation of the public space and the political space, first of all, to massage their egos, and number two, because it is a business enterprise. Many African politicians are actually businessmen, mm. and the state is their client. Mm. And, and of course, in order to ensure that they retain that position, they prefer to be little fish in small ponds mm -hmm. rather than to be in the ocean where there is real action. Mm -hmm. Of course, there are few leaders whom I can isolate as, as being really in the forefront of the struggle to make the Pan-African dream a reality. Paul Kagame is other problems notwithstanding, is such a leader, and you've seen even the kind of leadership that he has offered just recently in the conflict in, in Mozambique and his intervention in Cabo Delgado. Very quickly, he didn't mm. hesitate. Mm. Such is, is a leader who stands out. Mm. John Joseph Pombe Magufuli was already uh, beginning to manifest those tendencies. Apart from those two, Really, I cannot see any other way. President Uhuru Kenyatta? Not, has not convinced me. Has mm -hmm. not, there is nothing that President Kenyatta has done, in my view, to convince me that he is a dyed-in-the-wool Pan-Africanist. Mm -hmm. A dyed-in-the-wool Pan-Africanist speaks 
pan-Africanism oozes pan-Africanism. And, and to me, with due respect to my good friend Uhuru Kenyatta, I don't think that there is evidence on the table, at least avail available to me, mm. to suggest to me that he is such a, a, a leader that of the pan-African pedigree. Uh, I am not convinced. You're not convinced. I'm not convinced. Profits less than 365 days. Mm -hmm. To 2022 elections. Mm. Of course, the temperatures have already been rising. They've always been high. Every time we are just done from an election, we're already in electioneering period. I want to read your thoughts on the state of the politics of the nation today as we speak. Uh, we've had uh, Wafula Chibukati, the IEBC chair, saying that elections, as far as they're concerned, will be on the 9th of August 2022, uh, responding to the claims of a possibility of a postponement of an election. I mean, your take on... on, on of course, Chabukati is right. The constitution <laughs> is quite clear that the elections will be held on Tuesday, on the on second Tuesday, on the fifth day of... after five years. And that is the ninth day of August, the mm. year 2022. Mm. But what is tragic is that even as my good friend and classmate Chabukati announces this rough of things that must be done. Yeah. The truth is that there are people who have been campaigning since the year 2017. Yeah. There are some of them who have been on a campaign trail since the year 1997. Mm -hmm. The tragedy is this, that when a country is in a permanent and constant state of campaigning, it undermines the economy. Yeah. And particularly when a country's politics is based on ethnic mobilization, and the kingpins are fundamentally low voltage ethnic warlords, whose claim to fame is that they mobilize and weaponize their ethnicities, mm -hmm. then the country is in grave danger. Mm -hmm. In many countries, one year to the elections, you would not hear about elections mm -hmm. because you have the business of governing. You have the business of delivering services to the people. Yeah. Right now, you go to many of the counties, there is no activity. People are already angling for this or that office. You go to funerals, that is what they are doing. At the national level, you see the so-called leaders engage in meeting after meeting. And what they are doing is to focus on an election that is 364 days away at the expense of economic agenda. The net effect, and this is informed by the experience that we have had in this country, if you are an investor, you would not invest in Kenya from mm. this day on. Mm. You would wait until the year 2023 because we have also demonstrated that after every election we engage mm. or we find ourselves in a period of instability which takes almost a year to stabilize. To, to stabilize. Yeah. So that if I was an investor, I would now be going to Uganda, and it's happening. Mm -hmm. I would now be going to Tanzania, and it's happening. I would now be going to Rwanda, and it's happening. You look at what is happening to the port of Mombasa. Most of the goods are now migrating from the port of Mombasa to the port of Dar es Salaam. The Ugandans are using the port of Dar es Salaam more. The Rwandese are using the port of Dar es Salaam more. Eastern Congo is using the port of Dar es Salaam more. Burundi is using the port of Dar es Salaam more. South Sudan is using Port Sudan more. Ethiopia is using Djibouti and Asmara more. We are losing our economy is shrinking because we have mannerless and selfish politicians. And these politicians are the very same. They have no agenda, none mm. of them. Mm. Mm. These are the very same people who have been, they were in Moi's administration, they were in Kibaki's administration, they are in Uhuru's administration, and there's nothing new that they are telling the country. Mm. These are individuals who want to occupy the office of the presidency in order to fu fulfill the dreams, I'm told, the dreams of their tribes or mm. the dreams of, of, of personal ambition. And, and, and it's tragic. And, and one of the things that I must say, mm. We are the only country in the world where potential presidential candidates are retirees enjoying pension. Mm -hmm. It is dishonest. Mm. Raila Odinga is a pensioner from politics. Mm -hmm. Kalonzo Musyoka is a pensioner from politics. Musalia Mudavari is a pensioner from politics. And we don't call them out. How can they be enjoying taxpayers' money as pensioners 
and continue to engage in the same politics from which they purportedly retire. They'll tell me, we did not retire from politics. We retired from the office of prime minister, vice president, and deputy prime minister. Complete nonsense. Right. The problem in Kenya is the assumption by a certain class of politicians who have been active in the last 30 years that all Kenyans are a bunch of dunderheads, a bunch of nincompoops who can be manipulated, and this is tragic. Unfortunately, unfortunately, mm. people like us mm. are very easily dismissed yeah. as theoreticians who are talking about utopia. Because when the chips are down, this politician says the road meets the rubber when they meet their real electorate who do not care about these so-called intellectual arguments. Yeah. But if we are not careful, yeah. one day the country will pay for this because we are now going into an election in the year 2022 where none of the candidates is prepared to lose. Yeah. They are prepared for only one thing, to win. And if they don't win, they will say they have been rigged. And remember, they have weaponized their constituencies. Look at the number of militias that are now beginning to emerge in different parts of the country. They are being weaponized. Mm -hmm. And they are being prepared to reject the outcome, particularly of the presidential elections. Mm -hmm. I pray and hope that sanity will find space in the minds and hearts of those politicians. Right. Prof. Hunter, let's take a very short break. And when mm. we take this particular break, I want us, when we come back, mm. we look at corruption, and corruption, especially in this particular election, there are those who say that, um, uh, you know, voter buying and, 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 and all that is going to be a major, uh, you know, key player in, in determining even the future of how these elections are taken uh, and much more. So stay with us. We'll be back. And don't go too far. Right, welcome back. Thank you so much for still being with us right here. We are here discussing the future of the country and, of course, the state of affairs. And now we're going to be talking about, um, of course, the uh, state of our politics in the country. Prof, before we went for the break, you passionately described the state of affairs when it comes to the countdown to 2022 and what you feel, uh, you know, stands as red flags for the country. But I want to indulge you on the aspect of uh, corruption, which has always played a key role when it comes to the election period. I know there's been a lot of cases even during the terms of mm. those who are in office at those particular times, but we are hearing of, um, you know, uh, there's been a cap now mm -hmm. on, on, on spending. And uh, what we have been told is that the political financing um, uh, limit has been created ahead of 2022. A presidential candidate is not supposed to spend more than 4.4 billion shillings <laughs> euphoria <laughs> utopia reality theory <laughs> you know my name is julius nyerere used to say in kiswahili syria maendeleo ni watu ardhi na siasa safi yeah and when you talk about siasa safi that is where corruption comes in yeah unfortunately kenyan elections particularly since 1988 has been defined and has been dictated by corruption. Mm. And I think we assumed the worst level in terms of uh, the acceptance of corruption as part of Kenya's political DNA in 1992 yeah. with the advent of a ginger group called the Youth for Kanu 92. That is when bribery, open bribery became the fuel that moved Kenyan election. Mm. That is the period when you saw those who became real major players in the political class were former civil servants. Mm. Just take a head count. Mm. Former civil servants who had stolen as heads of parastatals, stolen as uh, permanent secretaries, then came into the political arena and distribution of money and other goodies became part of the manner in which we play politics. Today, corruption is the defining factor in the Kenyan electoral process. And I remember when we were in the process of making the constitution and gathering people's views in the year 2002, mm. we did suggest that we introduce hygiene in Kenyan politics 
by ensuring that expenditure in the political process is controlled. Mm -hmm. This ultimately found its way in the philosophy underpinning the Constitution of Kenya 2020, 2020 and now the Election Financing Act, which uh, Chairman uh, uh, Bukati, uh, Buka, uh, Chibukati has now uh, talked about. And, and, and the politicians you've seen have already railed against it. They say, yeah, no, yeah. you cannot cap it, yeah. which means, first of all, that they have the resources. Right. <laughs> you know, I mean, when you talk about the hundreds of millions that have been, or tens of millions which have been uh, the, uh, deployed as the cap for different uh, categories of political competitors and 4.5, 4 billion for presidential candidate, it tells you how corrupt, how expensive our elections are. Mm -hmm. And in any event, I understand where Chairman Chebukati is coming from, but remember that it makes nonsense of those cups mm. because these politicians have been campaigning throughout. How yeah. do they campaign? Mm. One, your CMA is, is what are they called? This uh, CMCs. Yeah. Yeah have a ward fund, MCA, MCAs, yes, yes, MCAs, yes. MCAs, they have a, a ward fund. That fund is fundamentally a slash fund. Mm -hmm. How is it a slash fund? If you were to examine it and you only have to look at the Auditor General's reports, you will discover that many of the companies that trade with the ward are either associated with the MCA or they are directly theirs. Mm -hmm. So out of that fund, they get a lot of money. The Constituency Development Fund is also another fund which is available for abuse mm -hmm. by the members of parliament. Mm -hmm. The governors on their part in the last eight years, we have, we have produced multi-billionaires through that fund. Mm. And of course, the women have their fund, the senators have their fund, and, and, and the political party's fund is another slash fund. Mm. Mm. You've seen the report of the Auditor General as regards the Jubilee Fund. We have not heard what has happened to the ODM Fund. All these funds, which are essentially taxpayers' money, has been av available for these political players for purposes of campaigning throughout. Tell me, relative to our GDP, how do you explain these politicians crisscrossing the country in helicopters? How do they finance them? Mm -hmm. How do they, in a, an economy such as ours, how do you have politicians traveling to their rural homes in helicopters for, ev for whole weekends, every weekend? It is a multi-million shilling enterprise. So what I'm saying is that the campaign has been going on since the year 2017. What Chairman Chebukant is talking about are funds that will be deployed mm, mm. to buy t-shirts and to buy kangas and other paraphernalia just in the very short period of the election. Mm. What we must strive to do is to introduce what I have earlier re referred to as hygiene in our politics. Yeah. In fact, if we were to conduct credible elections, this idea of party agents should be eliminated. The electoral body should be able to employ agents who preside over an electoral process. We should be able to have the, uh, uh, the IEBC organizing political rallies in terms of, uh, of uh, town hall meetings and having the parties articulate their agenda. But sometimes I fear that our politics has sunk so deep in the muck and mire of negative ethnicity and corruption that until and unless this generation of politicians, this generation of politicians, as long as they are alive and active Kenyan polit politics will never know change mm. because they have inculcated bad habits into the political arena. In a manner of speaking is like the Israelites. They left Egypt, but Egypt is still resident in them. Mm. This crop of politicians and their acolytes and hirelings can never participate in an election that is devoid of corruption. Right. And Prof, when we were talking earlier on, you mentioned that 
these leaders are the same. Yeah. They have no agenda yes. for this country. They don't mean well for the country. But the sad reality, um, uh, going by what you just said, is that come 2022, when they'll be announcing the winner of the presidential election, there is a high chance yeah. that one of them oh, that will is the, be the president. <laughs> that is the tragedy of Africa. <laughs> and, in fact, if you want to answer the question why Kenya can never realize a potential, why Africa can never realize a, uh, realize a potential, is, is, is uh, what Alban, Albert Einstein once said, doing the same thing every time and expecting a different result, mm. that we keep on recycling these leaders, the very same, mm. and you expect that there will be a different. Tell me, mm. of these individuals who have already declared themselves to be the presidential candidates, were they not cabinet ministers in mm. Moi's mm. cabinet? Mm. Were they not cabinet ministers in Kibaki's cabinet? Some of them, are they not cabinet ministers in, in President Uhuru Kenyatta's cabinet? Have they not always been there, some of them since 1982, some of them since 1992? What bright ideas could they possibly have? Some of them have been members of parliament when we had CDF go to the constituencies where they presided over. Mm. Is there any tangible change that they have brought? Mm. Some of them have been real leaders in the era of devolution. Tell me what have they have done in health. Mm. Tell me what they have done in education. Tell me what they have done in agriculture. Nothing. Mm. But tell me what they have done for themselves. They have become multi-billionaires. So the problem is also with us, mm -hmm. the electorate, at mm -hmm. least the majority of the electorate, because your typical Kenyan elector on the day of the election, they'll vote for individuals if they are president is because he's from my ethnic group mm -hmm. or he is aligned with somebody from my ethnic group mm -hmm. or because he or she is from my clan. Or because he or she has bribed me. Mm. When you continue to vote on that basis, then the results will be the same. Then your education sector will suffer. Then your health sector will suffer. Mm. Then your agriculture will suffer. Then your infrastructure will suffer. Then you will suffer and the country does not grow. Yeah. Unfortunately, we are co-authors of our own misfortune. We are co-authors of our own misfortune. But yeah. sometimes these politicians you've mentioned, they say, yes, we've been in those positions, but we've not been president. And they always argue that the buck stops with the president when it comes to the management of the affairs of the country. But then again, the citizenry, perhaps lack of options. You know, if you're not running, no, not, it's not lack of options. Yes. Let me tell you, I've, I at one time in the year 2007, I attested this thing so yeah. that you, this question you ask me, yeah. if, when it arises, I can tell you that I have actual experience. Yeah. I attempted to contest at the, in Kamukunji constituency. Mm -hmm. And let me tell you what my experience was and i've rendered it in a book a call for hygiene in kenyan politics and sanitizing kenyan politics mm. the experience is i believe what other sensible and well-meaning kenyan politician would experience one mm -hmm. when you are campaigning you are campaigning amongst people who are not voters in that area because in nairobi you'll find all most of the Luo voters have taken their vote in kibera mm -hmm. Most of the Luhia voters have taken their votes in Westlands. Mm. So that even in what you call a cosmopolitan area, voting is on the basis of ethnicity. Mm. And those who win will have mastered goons. Mm -hmm. They will bribe the electorate and that is what the electorate responds to. Mm. The problem of Africa is that we have an electorate that is not moved by ideas. And, and this is not only unique to Kenya, it's, it's the African problem. Mm. If you go to countries such as Sweden, the Scandinavian ideas, I'm now watching what is happening in Germany. The people are campaigning on the basis of two major things, mm. climate change. Mm. Mm. Bring that here in Kenya. And they, they say climate change. <laughs> 
Even if I wanted to talk, I see some of the presidential candidates are talking about the economy. But, but, but there is no in-depth analysis of what they are putting on the table. Mm. The Kenyan electorate, the African electorate must liberate itself from this quandary of using the ballot box to put a seal of approval in ethnic warlords. Mm -hmm. As long as it continues in this basis, mm -hmm. let me tell you, Africa will never realize their potential. And Kenya is in a worse state because now, apart from bribery, there is the continued use of, of, of militias. There is a research that is being undertaken by a friend of mine now, and he is amazed at the number of militias that are beginning to emerge. I do not have empirical evidence, but I have uh, anecdotal evidence. And you've seen recently the re-emergence of gangs in the coastal part of Kenya. Mm -hmm. If you look at many of those gangs, they'll be allied to politicians. Mm -hmm. And you'll see it even in public rallies. Politicians are accompanied by goons who will boo you down so that you don't even make your point. Mm -hmm. So in as much as you, don't, you say there are no options, there is a crop of politicians in Kenya who have succeeded in smothering credible opposition. And when you gave them the political party's funds, that was one of the ways in which they have used to smother credible opposition. And if you don't bow down to these ethnic warlords, these demigods of ethnicity, these latter-day bulls, then you are going nowhere in Kenyan politics. One day, and I look forward to that day when the electorate will wake up and reject them in their entirety. That is the way the day will have uh, introduced a new oxygen mm. into the Kenyan political system. Mm. But I don't see that happening in the next two election circles. Right. Um, Prof, before we finalize, mm. I mean, there's been a lot that has been said as far as um, the president and his deputy mm -hmm. is concerned. Mm -hmm. There are those who have outrightly called them out and said they are embarrassing the country, uh, depending or based on how uh, they are behaving um, in public. We've seen Deputy President William Ruto just the other day uh, coming out to condemn the government. And people have been asking which government is he condemning on the handling of the um, Turkish uh, investor, um, uh, Aydin. And, and I want to read your thoughts on whether you feel this was bound to happen because we've always seen every election, every election period, there's always a new outfit, there's always new euphoria and, 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 and so on and so forth. What is your take and what would you be telling these two leaders um, as far as the country is concerned? Know, when you look at this, let us not... Uh, this is not unique in Kenyan history, but yeah. perhaps this is the most infantile and the most embarrassing. Yeah. You'll remember very early on, immediately after independence, we had Joe Murumbi as the vice president, then we had uh, Ogingo Odinga and Jomo Kenyatta. And, and you will remember how disrespectful Ogingo Odinga was to mm. Jomo Kenyatta in, in Kisumu, mm. exchanging publicly mm. in 1969 with, 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 the, with, with Jomo Kenyatta at that time, and ultimately it led to his resignation. You will remember also when President Moy took over office, he had uh, three vice presidents. He had uh, Dr. Karanja as a vice president. He had Mwai Kibaki as a president. Vice he had, president. as a vice president, he had George Saitoti as a vice president. And, and you saw that even when President Kibaki took over office, and President Kibaki was the much more laid back person. But you can remember how his administration was subjected to rancor by the then Prime Minister Raila Odinga, mm -hmm. who was the effective number two. Mm -hmm. And why it not for President Kibaki's laid back approach, it would have been the same thing. And, and, and you can see, I'm giving you this history to mm -hmm. demonstrate mm -hmm. to you mm -hmm. that this kind of conduct within that uh, upper echelon of administration of Kenya is not unique. But I think this is the most embarrassing. It is embarrassing because we now see a number of state activities where you expect the vice president or deputy president to be present at. He's not. 
we now see the deputy president act actively participating in a political formation other than that on the basis of which he was elected into office. We now see exchanges between the deputy president and the president publicly. We now see uh, activities that are essentially designed to humiliate the deputy president. We see the president uh, uh, canoodling with the opposition and excluding his deputy president. This is embarrassing. And, and, and unfortunately, we are exporting these manners outside of the country. Mm. The recent spat involving a Turkish national has involved the Ugandan administration and uh, the national resistance movement in Uganda. It has involved the Turkish government. It is embarrassing. Mm -hmm. and, and, and this speaks to the quality of our politics as a country. Because our politics is not informed by any clear ideology. And because our political parties are simply election vehicles, there is nothing, there is no ideology that unites President Kenyatta and Deputy President uh, uh, William Ruto. They simply came together because a combination of the two of them guaranteed an ethnic majority mm -hmm. which could, in, could defeat the other ethnic combination. And once again, you can see that this is what is happening. We normally have these uh, uh, fair weather, uh, seasonal ethnic alliances. So in a nutshell, what is happening now between President Kenyatta and Deputy President Ruto is an embarrassment. It is sad. It is unfortunate. It's depicting our country as a country whose political habits are juvenile and infantile at the same time. It is sad. I pray and hope that this kind of thing should be brought to a stop. I would have expected two things ought to have happened. Mm -hmm. If I was uh, uh, William Ruto, I would have resigned. Mm -hmm. I'm quite clear in my mind. I mm -hmm. would have resigned. Mm -hmm. If I was President Kenyatta, I would have told my deputy president, we may disagree. I know you want to resign, but I don't want you to resign. Let us continue to engage constructively mm -hmm. so that even if there is no obvious camaraderie between us, but for the sake of the country, we are seen to be pulling in the same direction. Mm -hmm. In other words, the option of pre Deputy President Ruto is to resign, but I don't think he can, mm -hmm. because if he makes that mistake from yeah. a political standpoint, yeah. he'll be smothered. Yeah. So he's, he'd rather he remains inside so that he enjoys some of the protection that a Deputy President enjoys. Mm -hmm. On the part of President Kenyatta, he also is uh, not sure whether the Deputy President Ruto does not have the requisite clout mm -hmm. to defeat any attempt at removing him. Right. And in between is Kenya. Right. In between is peace and tranquility. In between is you and me mm -hmm. who are being subjected to this kind of humiliation. I've gone out of the country and every time I'm interviewed by media houses outside the country, they say, what is happening to your country? Mm. What is happening to your country? Every election circle you fight and your leaders are always fighting in public. What is wrong with your country? Mm. I am asked. Yeah. And when I'm out of the country, I try to be as polite as I can to my country. But in a nutshell, is embarrassing. It is embarrassing. Um, Prof, I'll, I'll not end this conversation without asking you this. Um, you were recently in the United States. Yes. You had a very uh, successful uh, tour mm -hmm. in the United States. And I want to talk about police brutality. Mm -hmm. uh, the country has continued to see uh, some of the incidences um, where, you know, there are some disappearances only for young men and women to be bodies to be discovered by the riverbanks. Uh, and I'm not uh, here alleging or saying that it is the police that have done that, but there are some outright cases where people have said it was the police that actually did the following things. You went and eulogized with the family of the late uh, Floyd. And I want to read your thoughts on what you feel would be the solution to ending police brutality in Kenya. What do we need? We had police reforms and we still hear of these cases. 
What do we need to end police brutality in the country? Recently, and I do not know the authenticity of this particular survey, mm -hmm. but the survey is reported by one of the media houses, the print, to have said that 50% of Kenyan police officers are unhappy with their jobs. Mm -hmm. If that survey is true, it tells you there is a problem. Mm. Which means that there could be a problem at the point of recruitment. Yeah. There could also be a problem at the point of training. And you and me know that uh, we have had cases, anecdotal evidence of people who are being recruited into these forces through bribery. So that I think is the foundational problem. I'll give you a personal example recently, mm -hmm. which is just uh, a week ago, I think that was in the first week of uh, the second week of the second day or the third day of August I had the misfortune of uh, going to represent a client in, in Makadara. This is a gentleman who had entered into a contract which was simply a contract. Mm. The other side reported him for obtaining money by false pretense. The case is still on. I'll not mention the case itself. But what amazed me that the entire system of the police force had been so weaponized against this individual that I asked the police officers, why does it take eight police officers to arrest a person whom I have personally surrendered in court? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And during that incident, one police officer said to Tamfunza, I'm giving this personal experience to tell you that there is a problem with our police force. Mm -hmm. And something must be done. We thought that when we had changed from police force to service, then we had changed it. But we must now ask ourselves, how do we train our police officers? Mm -hmm. Who do we allow to get into the police office or into the police service? Recently, when we were in the process of recruiting those who are going to serve in the ICBC, IEBC, we subjected them to a psychometric test. Is it not the time now to subject those who are joining the police office to a psychometric test? Mm -hmm. I remember in 1998, I visited the United States of America at that time. And we were with the, my good friend, I think, uh, Mutai Kagwe then mm -hmm. and, and Gishira Kibara. Yeah. And we visited two police offices through two, two states. It was on corruption and the police force. We visited the state of uh, of, of Oregon, the city of Portland, which was reputed to have the best police force. And we visited New Orleans, Baton Rouge in New Orleans, which was reputed, reputed to have one of the worst police forces, but which was changing. And during our conversation, they said, you've got to clean up your recruitment process. Mm -hmm. You've got to know who you are recruiting. You've got to know who you are training. You've got to be careful how do you train them and you've got to embed your police office in the community. Right. And in that way, they say they begin to see changes. Today, that is not the truth about training. In the United States of America, which as you rightly said, I visited and visited quite a number of states, had conversation with police officers and other people in the civil rights movement. There is now a deliberate effort to retrain or to look at the police forces anew. Mm -hmm. I think that there is a sense in which many police forces, including the ones like ours, which now call themselves services, still are reeling from the hangover of the colonial approach to policing. Mm -hmm. And policing is now about facilitating and enabling the society. Right. You go to countries such as Japan, you see how police officers, they behave like Boy Scouts and Girl Guides. And that does not mean that they are not effective in policing. They become friendly. You remember at one time in this country, we introduced something that was called community policing, mm -hmm. complete with stations in different estates, which was meant to ensure that the police were operating within the community. I don't know what happened to that. Yeah. I think there is a need to look at these things and merely denying that the police are not involved does not help the case. Mm -hmm. Because once the society believes that the police have gone rogue, then they are going to be hostile to the police. And the last thing I want to say, I think there is a problem with our police services in this country. Yeah. When you see that one of the largest growth industries in a country is private security firms, 
It means that we are surrendering the policing service to people who have not been trained anywhere. Look at the number of security farms that are emerging in Kenya yeah. and continue to emerge, whether in Nairobi or in rural Kenya. It means that the police service is no longer discharging their functions effectively and people are becoming more and more reliant on security, private security service who are not controlled, whose level and manner of training we do not know. Mm. This is the time when instead of issuing threats, those who are in charge of internal security, those who are in charge of the police service should sit back in humility and ask, what can we do to create a true service, which is a service to the people of Kenya? Right. Particularly as we are approaching the election where we'll require that policing is at its very best to nip violence in the bird. Right. Prof. Martin Luther King had a dream. Yes. I want us to close with what Professor Pielo Lumumba is dreaming. What's I, your dream? My dream has always been very clear. I look forward to a Kenya where there will be peace and tranquility and men and women will be judged, as Martin Luther himself said, on the basis of the, their character, mm -hmm. not on the basis of their ethnic extraction and on the basis of their ill-gotten wealth. When we realize that as a country, the men and women who will offer themselves for public service will be men and women who will serve this country and will be men and women who will look at Kenya as a good part of a united Africa. And when I talk about united Africa, I'm not naively saying mm. that it will be a country that is homogeneous. It will be a country that is heterogeneous where governance is for the benefit of the people of Kenya and countries such as Kenya will be mere units in a confederal government of Africa. It may not be achieved in my lifetime, but it's something that we must continue speaking about and working, toward, working towards. And I can tell you that in my own small way, I'm involved in a number of initiatives, both within and without the continent with the African diaspora, to move us in that direction. Ours is to make our contribution. As Mwalimu Nyerere used to say, it can be done. We play our part, and it is our part that we shall play in humility, in dedication, without fear, and without hesitation. Prof, thank you thank so you much for much. your time. God bless you.